Hello, and welcome to Introducing Me. I'm your host, Sarah. I started this podcast to get to know other people and lifestyles while discovering more about myself. Each episode, I will give a new guest a chance to discuss their background, culture, interests, or whatever they want to talk about to help increase all of our own worldviews. Today, I would like to introduce you to Catherine. She is an artist and designer. She has osteogenesis imperfecta, which is also known as brittle bone disease. So she's here to just talk about her life, and I'm excited to get to know her. So Catherine, thank you so much for being here. Why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit more about yourself? Hi, thank you for having me. Um, Yeah, so um, I'm an artist and a graphic designer. Um, I was born with a genetic bone disease called osteogenesis imperfecta, which basically means that my bones uh, break easily and grow abnormally. So I know you can't see me, but I'm actually only two foot seven. Um, I use an electric wheelchair for mobility, and I usually have an aide with me almost all the time. Um, I can't do things like um, go to the bathroom by myself or get food by myself or anything like that. I need help doing almost all of my daily activities. Um, I got into art uh, when I was really young. My parents, uh, so I went to a mainstream school. um, And when I was a senior in high school, that was the first time there was another kid in a wheelchair in school with me. So um, up until I was a senior, I was the only kid in a wheelchair. So, you know, obviously there were activities that my friends would go out and do that I couldn't do. And I was really smart and I was really bored and I was driving my parents completely insane. And so um, my mom was constantly trying to find things that I could do, you know, or things to keep me busy. And when I was five, she bought me my first watercolor set, um, which of course was a super cheap watercolor set that you would buy a normal five-year-old, right? Um, And I went through that in a couple of days, as well as all of the computer paper in the house. And I um, really got into art after that. Uh, My parents realized that it was not only something I loved, but it was something I was pretty good at, even as a five-year-old. So from there, they put me in art in school, of course, and then uh, private classes and some summer art camps. And so by the time I was a teenager, I had gotten exposure to a lot of different media. Um, I you know, had already done acrylic and oil, a little bit of sculpture, even a little bit of glass blowing, printmaking. I mean, you know, I got to do a lot of different things. And um, let me back up just a little bit. My parents uh, were both veterinarians. So my dad passed away several years ago, but my mom is still practicing today. And um, so I grew up with animals. You may hear some of my animals at some point during this podcast. Um, they're supposed to be quiet, but we'll see. Um, I, um, so I grew up with animals around me all the time. And when I was young, I would go to the office with my parents on Saturdays and just to do something. I would sit in the waiting room or the treatment room or whatever and paint the patients as they came in while they were waiting for my parents. And eventually the client started giving me money to do this. And, you know, like just voluntarily, you know, I didn't ask for it just voluntarily. And, um, as a 10 year old, that's pretty cool, right? To be sitting there enjoying painting and then get given money to do it. And so that kind of solidified my, uh, my want to continue art. Um, I sold my first painting officially when I was 10. Um, and that's in a gallery. That was pretty cool. And then, um, yeah, I mean, I, uh, worked with a private art professor, uh, who was a professor in college, but I worked with her as a teenager, um, every weekend. And she taught me more of the fundamentals of art the things you have to learn to be a good artist that are oftentimes very boring, but necessary. Um, So I learned all of that from her. 
And then I went into college at Loyola University in New Orleans, and I graduated with a BA in graphic design in 2011. And from there, I started my own business, Pack Art and Designs, which I run out of my house. Today, I do, I still do a lot of pet portraits. However, they have improved greatly since I was 10. Um, they look a little different than they used to look, uh, which I, I think is a good thing. Um, but yeah, so I still do a lot of pet portraits. I do a lot of other animal art, animal painting. Um, and then I do graphic design. So I do logos and branding packages and web design and social media management and that kind of thing. Great. I absolutely love your energy and definitely want to talk more about art. But I'm curious, you know, you said that a lot of the times you need an aid with you to do a lot of daily tasks. So what was it like going to a mainstream school? Um, it was, well, you know, the thing is that I have to do everything differently than most people. You know, I, um, I can still do a lot of things, but it's just different than how you would do it. Um, like for example, it's easier for me to lay down to do things. So like I lay down to eat a lot and I lay down to drink a lot and I lay down to paint. I lay down to draw. I lay down to write. Um, I lay down to work on my computer. Um, so having an aid, I mean, I always had an aid. So it was normal for me, you know, it was just the way my life had always been. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's kind of weird, right? To have somebody following you around as a kid, especially as a teenager, when you're, you know, that's a horrible time, right? I mean, nobody wants to go back to their teenage years. Like that's, that's you know, you're trying to figure out who you are and your friend group is changing because, you know, clicks are happening because teenage girls are horrible. And, you know, it's like, it's harder when you have an old person following you around. I mean, they might not really be old, but, you know, to a teenager, somebody in their 30s is old, right? So, um, yeah, I mean, it was, it was hard um, because I... I was always watched more than my friends were, you know, and, and I mean, that was for my own good most of the time. Sometimes people got a little overbearing, but um, for most, most of the time, it was for my own good. And of course, everyone meant well, you know, um, but yeah, I, it was, you know, I, I'm lucky because the school, the main school, the school I went to for the longest, my grade school um, was very family oriented. And so they did everything they could to include me in everything they possibly could. So it, you know, there weren't a whole lot of activities that I was left out of. And when there were, you know, like field trips I couldn't do or, um, any other kind of school activity, my parents would like, let's say there was a, like a hiking field trip. Okay. Obviously I can't go do a hiking field trip, so my parents would come up with another field trip that I could do that would teach me the same thing. And normally the school would let me bring a friend with me on my field trip. And they made it special, not different. You know, so like it, it worked. It worked out. Yeah, that's really great that you had such a supportive school. Have you kind of always been in an area that's been accessible for living in a wheelchair? Oh, no. I mean, New Orleans is not. New Orleans is not a great city for accessibility. I mean, you know, I love New Orleans, um, but the heart of the city is so not wheelchair accessible. Um, the streets are horrible. The sidewalks are horrible. Um, I mean, they've made some some improvements over the years. There are certain sidewalks in the quarter that have gotten much better. Uh, but there's a lot that happens. <laughs> um, a lot of the bars and shops in the quarter and downtown have steps up into them. Um, so obviously I can't go in there. 
And then because it's a historic district, they're grandfathered in and blah, blah, blah. And they don't have to um, adhere to the ADA rules that most people, you know, most places do. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the heart of New Orleans is not great. Their public transit is not accessible. Um, you know, actually, I mean, just from going on vacation, honestly, one of the best places I've been for accessibility is New York because their bus system is fully accessible. Now, the subways are terrible, but the bus system is completely and totally accessible. So if you can go there by bus, you're, you're good. Um, Las Vegas is also an excellent city for accessibility. Um, but uh, yeah, New Orleans is not great. The outskirts are better because that's not historic and it's not, you know, they actually have to play by the rules and they have to have handicapped accessible bathrooms and those kind of things. But um, anything that is grandfathered into the old parts of the city is, yeah, it's not great. <laughs> so then why stay in New Orleans? Um, well, because we've, I mean, we've always lived here. My, my, I have family that lives about two hours away. Um, and when my parents moved, they lived up north for a while. And when they moved down here, they wanted to open a veterinary business and they wanted to live close to my mom's family, but not too close. And they wanted to live in a major city. And this was just, just because they wanted to start a business, you know, so they didn't want to start a business in a small city. Um, so this was just the right place. And honestly, I mean, we have an incredible group of friends here. I love the culture here. I love the music. I love the food. Um, <laughs> I love, you know, I love the nightlife here. We get, you know, great concerts and great shows that come through here. Um, you know, it's just the accessibility thing is, is frustrating and it's something I'm constantly fighting against. Have you gotten things or any places to become more accessible? Yeah. So, um, so a couple of bars actually in the quarter that were not accessible before have bought ramps that you can buy on Amazon for like 80 bucks or less, um, that are just metal folding ramps. And they bought those to put down for people in wheelchairs when they want to come in, you know, because the rule in the, in the quarter is that you can't change anything, um, without jumping through a gazillion hoops. So like they couldn't put a ramp, a permanent ramp outside their bar. That's against city rules. So, but, but this works, you know, they can have a metal ramp that they can put down and pick up. Um, so several bars have bought those. Um, I, we have a festival here called the New Orleans Jazz and Heritage Festival. It's a huge, huge festival that happens every April and May, um, last weekend in April, first weekend in May. And, um, huge names come through. Like this year we had Stevie Nicks and Lionel Richie and, um, the Red Hot Chili Peppers. And I mean, you know, huge names as well as local musicians. And um, I was on the volunteer committee for that festival for a while, for several years in a row. And what I would do is go one day and assess all of their access areas. And, you know, we talk about like, okay, well, you know, this is a good area that you have these barricades here and I can't see over them, you know, and nobody sitting down can see over them. And I don't have the, cho I don't have the choice to stand up. Um, you know, or, you know, well, this is an okay spot, but it gets really muddy. So what can you put down, you know, so that we can not get stuck in the mud? Um, things like that. And they, I mean, leaps and bounds, like by far, I go to a lot of music festivals all over the country and by far jazz fest is the best for accessibility. And, and I, I hope that's partly because of my suggestions. Um, because, I mean, they've made incredible changes over the last, I would say, six or eight years. I mean, just excellent. And so you just said there that you go to a lot of festivals throughout the country. So do you fly often or? 
No, I drive a lot. Um, well, I don't drive. I have somebody drive me. So I have a friend um, that I met actually at Jazz Fest. And I- I'm a big music fan. I love music. I love live music. And this woman, who, like I said, is now a very close friend, and I were stalking the same band after uh, their performance at Jazz Fest. And we became friends. And obviously, we were meant to meet because, you know, we were stalking the same band. And um, <laughs> and so this, that was 12 years ago or wait, no, that was 13 years ago this year. And um, God, we've been friends a long time. Um, anyway, we started traveling together. Um, we started, you know, following. The, we both like the same type of music and so we started following a lot of different bands and um several of them know who we are you know it's crazy but but i mean we've driven to wisconsin we've driven to colorado um we have driven um of course all the southern states florida texas um alabama nashville um kind of think where else we've done north carolina I might, Colorado is definitely the furthest we've gone, but, um, yeah, it's, it's a lot of fun. It's our, it's our hobby. It's our getaway, you know, it's our escape from reality. So, um, but yeah, flying is hard. It's much, much easier to drive. And do you have any issues driving long distance? Cause like I hate being in a car for more than like four hours. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Um, it's not too bad. I mean, I, uh, again, I lay down to do a lot of things. So I lay down in the car. Um, it's actually safer for me to be laying flat. And so, um, you know, it's not like it hurts my back or anything to be, and now it hurts her back, but it doesn't hurt mine. Um, and the only thing is just that I have to sleep with oxygen because I have really bad sleep apnea. So I just wake myself up constantly if I go to sleep without it. So that's the only thing is like if we're driving at night and, you know, I fall asleep and then I wake up 20 minutes later and then I fall asleep and then I wake up, that makes me really tired. (laughs) But, um, but yeah, otherwise it's, it's not difficult. Yeah. I prefer to drive. Yeah. So you mentioned, um, that you're only two foot seven. So when you were yeah. growing up, did your like doctors kind of know what your future was going to look like? Um, they made some guesses. So, and I mean, honestly, they still don't really know. Um, I, my parents were told that I wasn't going to live very long. Um, so I, I don't know exactly what very long means, but I mean, I would assume, you know, a few years. Um, they were then later told that my life expectancy would be about 40. Um, however, I'm 33 and my, there's some, um, Facebook groups for this disease. And so, um, and I'm a member of most of them. And there are a lot of people with my type in this disease that are much older than 40 already. So, um, you know, I, I, you know, when they made these assumptions, I mean, that was 30 years ago, you know, and, and I think they've, they don't really know, you know, there's been new treatments, there's been, um, I think, how you take care of yourself definitely affects, you know, like anybody, you know, it definitely affects how long you're going to live. And um, I try to eat relatively well. And exercise some and you know probably not as much as I should but you know I mean I I try to be relatively healthy and um I mean I'm not saying I don't you know have a glass of wine at night or you know have dessert but you know everything in moderation um and so yeah I mean I don't I don't really know but I'm pretty sure it's going to be past 40 so we'll see right (laughs) Now, did you spend like a lot of time getting various like treatments or seeing doctors? Um, apparently we did when I was really young. I don't really remember that. Um, the treatment. 
So I do physical therapy every other week. So that that I have done basically my entire life. Um, the treatment that I received when I was young was I had metal rods put in my legs and my arm um, because those bones would break really easily and the rods give them strength. And that, that's been excellent. Like that's a great treatment for this disease. Um, and honestly, the younger you put the rods in, the better off you are. Um, I was four when mine were done and I was one of the first to like of my severity to ever be done with these types of rods. Um, in fact, my, <laughs> my doctor, like literally my surgery put him on the map and he used to use me as an example in all of his talks. And he was the head of orthopedics at that hospital he worked at. And, you know, literally I was like his, you know, his golden case or whatever you want to say. Um, but, um, there are some other treatments that are, uh, infusions, there are bioplasminates. It's, it's, um, it's, it's something that's supposed to help strengthen bones. And it's something that is most effective if you get it when you're a child. And when I was a child, they were very, very, very new. And there was a lot of side effects still. Um, and, and honestly, you know, that was only 30 years ago. So we still don't know what the long-term side effects of it, of it really is. And they're starting to see some issues now, um, with some cases, uh, regarding bone density later. And, um, it, uh, you know, it, it's not something my parents wanted to risk when I was young. And at this point, it's, I mean, it's not even on the table for me. Um, and it's not something I would necessarily want to do anyway. My mom is actually a homeopathic veterinarian. And so I do a lot of holistic medicine, uh, to handle pain and to heal quicker and that kind of thing. So, um, I'm not somebody who goes to the doctor a lot. I don't, um, I don't take a lot of medicine. Um, I take vitamins, but I don't take a lot of like narcotics or painkillers or anything like that. Mm -hmm. When you've got the physical therapy every other week, and so you've kind of got this good routine, it sounds like. Yeah. Yeah. And I see a massage therapist. Um, now, I mean, I'm saying that, but both my physical therapist and my massage therapist, I mean, my physical therapist has been working with me since I was eight and my massage therapist since I was 13. So, I mean, you know, I don't go to just anybody. Um because, you know, people can really hurt me, you know, it's, and it's really easy to really hurt me. So, you know, I trust these two, I mean, literally with my life. So, um, you know, if something were to happen where I could not see them anymore, that would not be a great thing. I'm sure I could find somebody else, but um, I'm lucky because I have two really good people right now. Right. Now, have you, have have you had different aids throughout your life or has it mm -hmm. been mostly consistent? Um, no, actually. I mean, when I was in grade school, I had one that was pretty consistent um, from I think second to eighth grade. <clears throat> but um, once I went into high school, so I went to a private grade school and nothing was paid for by the state by, in a private grade school. But when I went to high school, I went to a public high school. Um, it's now technically charter, but it was public at the time. And because it was a public school, the state provided an aid for me while I was in school. So at that point, um, we turned over aids because actually the lady that had been with me through eighth grade, she was ready to retire anyway. I mean, she was 65 and, you know, it was time for her to retire. And, um, you know, it, we ended up just with somebody after school, like they would come and pick me up from school and then take me home and do whatever it was I had to do at home, homework, you know, whatever. Um, but, but because that was such a part-time job, you know, because that was what, three o'clock to six or seven o'clock, five days a week. I mean, that's, that's not a lot of hours. Um, 
the people we could find to do the job were often students, you know, like college students. And, you know, they don't keep jobs like that for too long because their schedules change and their class schedules change. And, you know, it just doesn't work for them. So we, we definitely went through some aids um, in high school and same for college because it was kind of the same situation. I was provided an aid during school hours and then we provided one after. Um, and then after I graduated, we went through a couple, a uh, couple of nightmares actually. And then, and then, um, we ended up with one that has been with me for 11 years. So, um, she's wonderful. She's like family. So it's, you know, she's been with me and, and then I also have a part-time one on top of that. So I have one that works three to four days a week. And then I have one that works two days a week. So. Yeah, right now. Well, I'm glad you got past the nightmares. Yeah, it's, you know, (laughs) sometimes it just doesn't work out, you know? Yeah. So switching gears to the artistry of your life, Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned while like learning your craft and getting all of the knowledge that you tried a lot of different mediums. So can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah. Um, so I started in watercolor and it's interesting because that's where I ended up. Um, but, and I, and I can't really tell you why it's just the one I connect with the most. Um, but when I started classes, um, I'm trying to remember what we worked in first. I probably worked in just pencil, like just graphite and charcoal first. Um, because that's generally what you use to learn the fundamentals, like, you know, to draw a perfect circle without a compass and draw a straight line without a ruler. Um, And that's not a fun thing to learn, you know, because they make you do it over and over and over and over and over. And it's really boring. (laughs) Um, But I mean, something you need to learn how to do, you know, to be a successful artist. Um, So yeah, I did that. Um, I learned acrylic. Uh, I did not love it, but it would probably be my second choice. Um, it's, it's a lot of layering. I mean, it's a lot of learning how to use the mediums with the paint. And, um, and, and I mean, I could still do it. I just don't. It's just not something I particularly want to do. Um, and then I learned oil in between there with another teacher and I kind of hated oil. I mean, I loved my teacher. She was super fun and super talented, but um oil oil is very messy and it's um it smells really bad because it requires a lot of chemicals. Uh it doesn't dry very quickly. So, uh, I mean, there are oil paintings from like the Renaissance that never dry because of the oil in them. Um, I don't have patience for that. So that's not, that is definitely not my medium. Um, I had to do a little bit of it in school too, in college. And I just, I did not like any of it, not any minute of it. Um, And then I had another teacher that taught me sculpture, which I actually loved. I had a, a, I had a kiln at home. My mom bought me a kiln for my birthday, I think, one year. And unfortunately, um, we lost that in Hurricane Katrina, but um, we just never replaced it because it wasn't something I was focusing on doing. And, you know, it just, it was, that was kind of more of a hobby than work. Um, Because by that point, I was already starting to specialize in watercolor and I just, between school and that, I just didn't have time, you know, to do anything extra, but um, it's something I might want to replace one day and get back into. I don't know. We'll see. Um, I went to a summer art camp at the New Orleans School of Glassworks, and we got to do a little bit of stained glass and glass blowing and printmaking, which was super fun. Um, Glass blowing is really fun. I mean, obviously... Like, the kids didn't do any of the real dangerous stuff. You know, there was always a teacher doing the really hard 
heavy molten glass part, you know, but you actually get to blow the like blow through the tube and blow the glass and design what you want to make. And um, that was that was a really fun camp. I love that. I did that a few years in a row. Um, yeah, and I did some. Um, oh, this is the other thing. So I also designed jewelry. <laughs> um, I started that when I was about 14, 14 or 15. My dad had a client that um, had started designing jewelry and he introduced us and we became really good friends, which is kind of hilarious because we're like 40 years difference in age. So, uh, but we became really, really close friends and she taught me how to make jewelry. And so I've been doing that for a while. That's on my Etsy store. Um, and I do jewelry shows, especially toward the end of the year when it's gift buying season. Um, but yeah, that's a lot of fun too. Yeah, I do a little bit of everything. Yeah, <laughs> you definitely got to learn quite a bit and find out what you like and, and what you don't like. Yes. Yeah, when, and what's interesting is that the fundamentals are the same. Like in every medium, it doesn't, you know, the the you have to have balance and you have to have value and you have to have shade. You know, it, all of that is all of that is the same. You know, so as long as you have a good grasp on those fundamentals, you know, you're you're going to be able to hack it in almost any medium. You know, you may have some that are better than others. I mean, I certainly do, but um, you know, you, you'll be able to hold your own. Right. So physically is like, cause you mentioned, you know, that you lay down for painting. Mm -hmm. Is there any ever like difficulties or issue with the fact that like you lay down while painting? Cause I'm imagining a mess. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So when I was 13 or 14, I started working with this college professor named Robin and, um, you know, that's kind of when I turned, because I said she, as I said, she um, taught me the fundamentals, right? But that's kind of when I turned from art as a hobby to art as a career. And she actually laid on the floor with me to help, like, to see what I was seeing. Because when you look at something laying down, it looks very different than when you look at it sitting up. Um, the angles are different. Everything looks totally crooked. Um, so like I, she would set up a still life, you know, something for me to paint from life and, or to draw. And I would draw it and like, I thought I was seeing it, but it would, you know, we sit up the paper and it would be totally off, like totally, totally off. And, um, she would say, okay. Now I'm going to lay on the floor with you and I'm going to be at your angle and I'm going to teach you how to compensate for that. And so that's what she did. She taught me to what degree I needed to compensate for my angle. And that's when I, I always say, that's when I learned to draw. Like that's, that moment was when I was like, oh, okay, that makes total sense now. Um, so that was, that was very helpful. And, um, I definitely would not be able to do what I do today without her um, because that was that was a major turning point for me. Yeah. Dog. In case you can't hear her. <laughs> are, are all of your dogs girls? They are. They are all girls. Yeah, they're a handful. But, you know, when you live with a veterinarian, that's, that is the way it happens. <laughs> are, are they big dogs, small dogs? We have a little bit of everything. Um, <laughs> we have Paisley, who is talking right now. Um, Paisley is about 11 pounds. Uh, she's a Pomeranian mix. And then we go all the way up to a Coonhound, who is like 60-ish pounds. She's, she's relatively big. But yeah. That's great. And we have everything in between. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> Oh gosh, I I cannot imagine five dogs. <laughs> it can be a lot. <laughs> they can be a lot. Um, 
we would not have five dogs if mom was not a veterinarian for sure um because you know they're it's i mean it costs money you know to keep them healthy and a lot of ours are rescues so obviously so they have some issues you know they all have their health issues or whatever and a couple of them are getting older and you know i mean it's it's definitely helpful to have a vet in the house yes yeah definitely yeah. Um, so you mentioned that you sold a piece um, in a show really early on. So are you still doing shows or like fully selling online? Yeah. Yeah. So, well, I mean, COVID kind of made me have to only sell online for a little while. But I, um, so my grandparents started giving me art and jewelry shows in their house when I was like, 14 or 15. And so basically what would happen is I would bring all of my work to their house. I'd set it all up and then all of their friends would come. They'd serve some food and some alcohol and everybody would buy stuff. And then, you know, they'd go home and I would make some money and then everybody would have gifts for their friends and family and whatever. Um, So I actually, as I got older, I mean, this was after college, mostly, but I actually took that model and, and like really honed in on it. So I have, um, people who, and you know, anybody can do it, but I have some regulars, but people sign up, basically they pick a date. Um, I bring all my stuff to their house or their office or their church or whatever. And, uh, we set it all up. It takes about three hours to set it all up. And they invite all their friends, their family. Um, Again, we have wine and uh, hors d'oeuvres. And then um, they get, the host gets a percentage of what I make. So they can take that in merchandise or they can take that as a check or I can donate to something in their name. Um, And then we pack it all up and go home. And it's, you know, it's a long day. But it's a lot of fun because I actually, I love to meet people. So I love to get to meet the people that are buying my work. So it's, it's a lot of fun. That, that's, we call that show season. And show season is mostly like September to December. And it's insane. I mean, it gets, I'm usually doing a show every other weekend. And it's just, that's also pet portrait season because everybody wants pet portraits for Christmas. And like my life is just completely nuts between, sometimes it starts as early as August, but it's usually like solid from September to the end of the year. So yeah, but yeah, it's a lot of fun. I love it. We had, I had my first one back um, the end of last year. So I think we did November. Or October, I don't remember. But we did a couple at the end of last year, and we did one at the beginning of this year, which was okay. But nobody's buying anything at the beginning of the year. Everybody has to pay taxes. Like nobody has the money. So, um, including me. So, so um, that's it's just not a great time of year to do that. But uh, it's it's been good. I'm happy that we're able to get back out and do that again. Yeah. So how often, or like how much of your day do you think is making more art? Um, It depends on the day and it depends on deadlines. So as I said, I graduated in graphic design. So I also do a lot of logos and branding and um, web design and stuff like that. And a lot of those clients have really hard deadlines. Um, You know, you can't like... You, you can't say, oh, I'll just do it tomorrow when the printer needs it today. You know, like it, it doesn't, you can't do that in design. So, um, you know, that always comes first. That's, that's always like, if I have deadlines, like I just wrapped up a project. Um, I have an event that I did all the design for that's happening Thursday, but everything had to be at the printer last week. So like last week, that's all I was doing was this project because it was a lot that had to be at the printer by a certain time on a certain day. And if it wasn't there, 
it wasn't going to get printed in time for the event, um, which would be very bad. So, um, so that's what I did all last week. Um, at Christmas time, I am usually painting pretty solidly every day. Like, I would say at least four to five hours a day. Um, sometimes more if I can push myself to go more than that. Uh, because I have pet portraits coming out of my ears usually at that time. I'm just, this, this past year, I had more pet portraits than I have ever had at Christmas. And it actually took me until the end of March to catch up <laughs> because what would happen, you know, I, I always put this out there, you know, starting in August, you know, you got to get me your pictures for your pet portraits if you want one for Christmas, because October 15th, I'm cutting it off. You know, I, I, that's the deadline if you want it for Christmas. And inevitably, after October 15th, I get all these requests for pet portraits. Well, can you just squeeze one more in? And most of the time, the answer is no. Sometimes I can. I try. But, you know, there's only so many hours in the day. And there's only, only so many days in the week. And so um, I, what I do is I give them gift certificates because normally they're buying them as gifts. So I give them a gift certificate and I say, okay, give this to your mom or your aunt or your sister or whatever and tell them it's coming. And just, you know, I'm, I'm going to get to it, but it's going to be a little bit. And so by the time I got through all of those, it was the end of March this year. So it's, it's been crazy. I, I mean, this year I'm working on my 30th pet portrait already. And it's not quite the end of May. So it's, I mean, it'll be done before the end of May. So it's, it's, I, I've never done that before. I've never had this much demand. So it's good. I mean, it's a good problem to have. That's exactly what I was going to say. A good problem to have. <laughs> yeah. Not complaining. Uh, so before I start to wrap things up, is there anything else that you would like to share with the listeners? Um, I don't know. I, um... I did write a book. I guess we could talk about that for a second. Um, I actually, so I wrote one book and I illustrated one book. So let me start with the one I wrote. Um, my, it's my personal story. It's kind of a lot of what we talked about here today. Um, it's called Looking Up. And it started off as a, as my senior thesis in college. And um, it was picked up after I graduated to be published. So, you know, we edited it and made it into like a real coffee table book. Um, but it's basically my story and it's about how I live and things that have happened to me and um, that kind of thing. And it's uh, got a lot of photography that I took and um, that kind of stuff in it. I mean, it's a design project. So it's a very art based book. Um, and, it, and the second one, is called Breed All About Us, which is a compilation of 64 dog breeds. Um, I painted a series of 64 dog breeds, like portraits of 64 dog breeds. And my neighbor and I collaborated to create this book. Um, she's a writer and she actually interviewed people who owned each breed to get information about what it was like to own the breed. And then she wrote like a three to five sentence paragraph about each one to put, you know, to put with each painting. And uh, it's also a coffee table book. It's really cute. It's very personal. Um, you know, we put some of some very factual things in there as well, but a lot of it, well, first of all, it's written from the perspective of the dog. So the dog is telling you about, themselves and then um the you know we we took stories from the people she talked to so like for example the saint bernard talks about eating a couch because i actually know somebody who saint bernard literally ate their couch like literally the lady left for work she came home the couch was gone like literally um and you know it, it's full of things like that and it's cute. It's a, it's a cute little read. Kids love it because of all the pictures and, um, it's a great gift for dog lovers. So that's both of those are available on my website, which I assume, um, people are going to be able to get to, but it's CAC Art Nola, K 
aakartnola.com. And I have an Etsy store that's attached to that. So you can find a lot of my art um, on products in my Etsy store. Um, so like I put my art on pillows and blankets and towels and mugs and things like that. So you can find all that there. And as well as my books and some paintings and some prints and things like that. Um, and then, yeah, I do public speaking. So um, both in person and on Zoom. So that's also something I am open to that you can read about on my website. You've got so much going on. Um... Oh, my God, it's been crazy. This this last like these last couple months, I'm like, oh, my God, I'm going in so many directions right now. You know, but it, it's hard because COVID shut everything down for so long that I'm like, okay, I want to go in all these directions, you know, because now I want to make up for not doing anything for two years, you know? Right. And I mean, it, it sounds like it's all so good and that you're in, enjoying all of it. Yeah, definitely. I mean, of course, there are days where I'm like, oh my God, I'm so tired. <sighs> but, you know, that's okay. It's all good. Those are relatively few and far between. Yeah. Now, at the end of every episode, I do ask all of my guests a random question. My question for you, since you have shared that you're such a music lover, is what is your go-to karaoke song? I have actually never done karaoke, um, which is uh, really interesting. And if any of my friends are listening to this, they're going to make me do it at some point now. Um, I... I don't know what my go-to karaoke song would be. Um, I'm I'm a country music person. I love country music. So probably anything country. Um Sugarland is one of my favorites. So any of the anything by them, or Little Big Town, or Reba, or Garth Brooks. Any of them. Um, but then I also love like, you know, I grew up listening to what my parents listened to. So I grew up listening to 60s and 70s music, especially 70s. So, you know, I mean, and, and some 80s. So like, you know, Journey or um, Elton John or Billy Joel or um, Bon Jovi. I know that's more 80s. Um, you know, Cindy Lauper, any, any of that kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, I don't have a specific song, but, but I do know a lot of music. So... I'll have to get back to you on that one when somebody drags me out to do karaoke, which I'm sure now is bound to happen. I'm going to need a little bit of alcohol for that. But yeah, <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. I love music. I don't sing well, but I love music. So, yeah. All right, that brings this episode to a close. As Catherine mentioned, her website, of course, will be in the description, and I'll also leave a direct link for her Etsy as well as her Facebook and Instagram if you'd like to go follow her social media pages and connect with the great work that she's doing. And of course, if you would like to connect with the podcast, our website is in the description as well. That brings you to all of our past episodes, all past resources and social media. And it brings you to our social media as well, Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn. And if you'd like to be a guest on the podcast, my email is there. So feel free to reach out to me. Or if you'd like to support the podcast monetarily, a link to do that is in the description as well. So thank you so much, Catherine, for spending time with me today. And to my listeners for taking the time out of your day to hear a new story. Until next time. Bye. Thank you so much. Have a great day.